The last speaker is YouTube Wang. His title is Class of Space Time from the Quantum Today. So I'm going to talk about uh, a series of work that has been started since uh, the end of last year uh, and shown here. Um, so it's really a, a, a new approach or a, a more modern approach to thinking about uh, basically uh, various uh, issues about the classical space time. So we used to discuss, to discuss classical space time in terms of the metric. Uh, but we also know that the metric is highly, it has a lot of problems associated with it, including it's not really a gauge invariant thing to begin with, and that this, for example, is core independent. And what is gauge invariant is a physical observable. For example, it's just even in the classical GR, we talk about uh, observables of deflection angle, about the impulse that uh, an that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, observer would feel, and so and. Finally, if the space-time, we often say that if space-time is emergent, that means that we should be able to talk about all these physical observables associated with the metric uh, without ever using the metric itself. In other words, uh, we want to talk about, we want to approach issues about the classical gravity or, or, or observables associated with classical gravity and then using just physical observable. Now, we of course, we know that this has already been done uh, for a large extent in terms of uh, perturbative gravity and around flat space-time. So in this talk, I want to talk about what about classical solutions, in particular, what about black holes? Okay, can we approach black holes in a similar way as, as we approach uh, just usual uh, gravity scattering? So we're going to talk about black holes. Now, if we, if, if we start to think about black holes or classical solutions that looks like black holes, uh, basically, the no hair theorem tells us that these things are just classified by a few numbers, a, uh, a few handful of quantum numbers, the charge, the mass, and the spin. These aren't exactly the same quantum numbers as you would use to characterize particles. Right? So that means, in some sense, black holes are just like particles. And if you want to think about it in that way, then the first thing you want to say is, how do I think about black, how do I look at black holes uh, in that I know that it will look like particles. And for example, in terms of uh, black hole merger, the, the process, you will think, okay, so what about the physics around the in-spiral phase, where the black holes, two black holes are far away? Can we think about this as these two black holes in this context as just particles? Now, you might say that this, of course you can do that. I mean, anything you, you stand far away is gonna be look like a point particle if you're sufficiently far away. So what is really in the, what is the teeth in this content? What is not trivial about this? Well, what is not trivial is that everything far away, even though it's far away, doesn't mean that it looks like a point, it is the same point particle. So when we talk, so I'm going to borrow the language of, uh, of, of classical GR people who compute these, these in spiral phase. And usually what they, what they discuss is they would use what is called a world line action, the world line action of this, of this black hole. And which, of course, this is a world line, so therefore they're treating it as a point particle. So they will write down the world line action, and this world line action has exactly the term that you would expect, just the kinetic term. But importantly, it's going to have non-trivial, higher, quote-unquote, higher dimension operators. Now, these operators are basically uh, telling you how the world line degrees of freedom are coupling to the, this non-trivial background. Here, I'm writing E and B. Uh, e is basically, uh, you can sit, uh, view it as the electric part of your Riemann tensor, and B is the magnetic part, which uses the Lavigier-Vita tensor. Now, for example, just using these two simple operators as an example, 
black hole is different than neutron star. So this is the famous the vanishing of love number. So if you look at the short shell black hole and you compute the, the coefficient here, the CD and the CB, it's actually zero. Whereas if you compute it for neutron stars, these are actually have non-zero numbers. Okay, so even though you're far away, I'm using a world line to discuss my object, but they actually they are described by very different uh, world line actions. So even though they're point particles, they're different point particles. Now, in fact, if I turn on spin, since most of the black hole that we're talking about, the, astroph the astrophysics black hole, they're spinning, then it becomes even more, uh, even, there's even more degrees of freedom. So if I just include spin, so that means my world line action needs to include my spin operator here, then the possible term, even just at linear order in Riemann terms, so there's infinite number of uh, multiple moments that you can have that you write down. Each moment is tagged with a, with a non-trivial coefficient here that you need to fix. And of course, I don't need to tell you that different coefficient corresponds to different scalar objects. Okay, so they are the, they are the same. Now, for example, if you want to get the coefficient for, for, for this for a curved black hole, here's what you would do. So you, you take the curved black hole metric, uh, and I'm writing it in the first post minkowskian order, so I'm just expanding it in first order in G. Now once you have the metric, you can invert uh, using the retarded Green's function to get what your stress tensor that would source this kind of metric would look like. And then you just basically put the stress tensor on your world line action, and these cores will give you precisely the world line operators that are sourcing uh, this background, which corresponds to the rotating black hole. And if you do all this procedure, you'll find that the Wilson coefficients for these operators are actually exactly equal to one. Okay? So this is the smoking gun uh, that, uh, that tells you that when you have this world line action, you write down that is a curved black hole. And actually, I'd like to mention that this is actually only computed in 2017, even though GR has been more than 100 years. And really, it's because of the fact that uh, these spin multiples are difficult to compute. OK, so we have the fact that C equals 1 is for curved black hole. Now I want to ask. So what is the physical, physical principle that select these coefficients? And how, and once I identify how, how, are, how what principle is that encodes that? And I can also ask, like, well, for different Cs, how do you use different Cs or whatever the principle is to characterize the different black hole-like solutions? So in this talk, I'm going to I'm going to approach this problem in a computer in, in a purely on-shell fashion. So the point is that these operators yield a scattering amplitude of a massive object coupled to a graviton, right? Because these are operators with, that couple to a single Riemann tensor. So that means I can take these world line action, and let me just, ten let me just uh, tensor a sandwich it with polarization vectors of whatever spin I have. Then I will get a scattering amplitude. So I start with the world line, oh, sorry, world line operator and I'll end with a scattering amplitude. So that means these world line action is telling me that I have some interesting scattering amplitude I can look like. So I'm going to start from this direction. So these objects are, are quantum. These objects are scattering of quantum numbers with the same quantum numbers as, as you would use for a curved black hole. And so we would like to start. So we'll look at what are the possible scattering amplitudes that you would have. So the scattering amplitude that you're talking about is, of course, we're going to set up our end state and out state. Now, because the in-state and out-state are massive objects, so that means that they carry the massive little group, which are SU2 in four dimensions. So that means that you're writing down some object here that carries non-trivial SU2 indices. So who is responsible for carrying these SU2 indices? So we we'll naturally use what is known as a spinner helicity formula, which for the massive case just tells you that when you write your momentum in terms of a bi-spinner form, there's going to be two uh, eigenvectors. So you have a natural doublet here and the doublet is contracted, and therefore this tells you that this is precisely the SU2 little group. And so we're going to use these lambdas as our variables to describe the three-point interactions. Now, since my three-point interaction is carrying these non-trivial SU2, so that means it must be proportional to these lambda here. So basically, just in these two slides, what I'm doing is I'm characterizing the possible three-point amplitude just completely in a kinematic fashion. Okay, and then you'll see that it's very interesting that just this kinematic fashion alone will give you all the possible black hole space time, just deriving from this simple kinematic analysis. So, so these are essentially just like the external wave functions you write up. So you can peel this off. So the really non-trivial thing is what remains here, which are basically just SL2C tensors. 
So the question is, do you want to construct a general tensor here that carries these SL2C indices? So my problem just boils down to the simple problem is that, uh, is that I, need to find, I need to find a basis vector to span these SL2C spaces. Now the natural thing I would do is, since I'm coupling to a massless leg, I can use the massless spinner to, 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 to span the space. So I'm going to use uh, lambda 3 and, and orthogonal to lambda 3 as the two uh, basis vectors. There's one more thing I'm going to introduce, which is extremely crucial in this talk, is that since my, the kinematics tells me that P2 dot P3 is 0, this actually tells me that the lambda 3 is actually proportional to lambda 3 tilde. And the proportionality, I can use it to define what is called x. So the, only, so the, the important point here is I'm defining an object that is called x. This object is defined just from kinematics. And what you see is that this x will turn into a black hole. So in other words, all the possible black hole uh, uh, space time that, that we know of in four dimension is all characterized by this interaction of this x. And the origin of this x is completely defined kinematics. And I'll show you evidence that how this is true. So, but as I go on, so basically, once you have these variables, now you can span all the possible interactions. So for example, you have a spin one half particle coupled to a photon. These are the possible interactions. Uh, if you have a spin one, these are the possible interactions. So this kind of uh, basis is purely kinematic and origin. So it doesn't use any field. So we're not talking about gamma matrices or psi. These are just kinematic bases. And since they're kinematic bases, so they're really physical. How do you see that they're physical? For example, these, this G is precisely G minus 2. Okay, this G1 factor is precisely G minus 2. You don't need to do any gamma matrix reshuffling. In the kinematic basis, this is just purely separate term. Uh, so these are the G minus 2 for the W, for example, for the W boson. It will look like this. And you can go on for higher spin. But since I want to talk about black hole, you might imagine, uh, if I ask you what will black hole look like in this basis, since black hole is simple, you, you, might, you might expect that, okay, so maybe black hole is just when all of these multiple moments uh, are set to zero. And that is cor the correct answer. So if I'm talking about, um, I want to wonder what is this minimal object that I have here this, that only involves x and no multiple moments. This is the form that you would get if you tag on to uh, all the external life factors you, you tag back on. So these are what we call the minimal coupling. Now you can ask what corresponds to these amplitudes. Uh, you might wonder if it's string theory, but if you compute string theory, you'll see that this is maximally not this, because this is maximally complicated. So since we already have our world line action, so we can compare with the world line action. So if I take my world line action and I put it in this kinematic basis, this is what the world line action predicts for my amplitude. This is what I have for my minimal amplitude. So now I can just match this to my world line action and just read off what the coefficient of these Wilson uh, coefficients are uh, for these world line actions. And if you work it out, you'll find that the Wilson coefficients is, for the minimal coupling is just one plus a bunch of things that are suppressed by S, which tells you that if you take S to be large, this CS, this Wilson coefficient, it will just be reduced to one. In other words, if you take S to, to, to be large, this gives you precisely the black hole Wilson coefficients. Now, what do I mean by S is large? This is, I, I should put back H bar here, so this is really talking about S over H bar large, so that means you're taking the classical spin limit. So, the claim is that this object here is telling you that it's a, black, it's a curved black hole that is sourcing a graviton. So let's just verify this. You can take two of these objects and you connect it with the graviton. This will form a four-point amplitude. Now, you can find a map that tells you that four-point amplitude, when you take the, 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 transverse, uh, the, the, the transverse momentum to be, to be Q squared to be solved, then this actually gives you the gravitational potential between these two objects to the first order in, 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 in G. So you just plug in this into here, which is just a product of these two things, since there's two of these here. Then you can and do the Fourier transfer, this is what you get. And this exactly matches with the GR computation. Okay, so you can successfully just use this simple, single object here to reproduce the gravitational potential involving two spinning uh, black holes. Uh, uh, where the distance are between each other. Good. So if you believe me that I get just give you an interaction that, that describes curved black hole, what does this interaction tell us? It, can this tells us something something new? 
Well, first of all, uh, I probably, I, probably did, I didn't I, I didn't mention this uh, before, but the difference between coupling to a, a graviton and a photon in this context is just going from x to x squared. Okay, so you just squared it. So this h is a helicity. So if you go from h from one to two, and you just change the, what you mean by the coupling. Then you get the gravitational you get the gravitational coupling from the from the photonic coupling. So this implies that the curved black hole is actually a double copy of some electric object from this analysis. And indeed, this was known in 2014 when uh, Donald O'Connell and, and, and Chris White and uh, and his collaborators they showed that if you put the Kerr black hole solution and also the Kirchhoff solution in what is called the Kirchhoff form. Uh, so that's given by, the metric is given by uh, a flat part plus k nu, k nu times, times a scalar. The k is not a momentum, it's some null vector. Then you can take a single k at times pi r, and then you get electric potential. And they show that the Schwarzschild solution, if you put it in this Kirchhoff form, you take a single copy of k, you get the Coulomb potential. And, the, and you take the Kerr uh, rotating black hole solution here, and then you take a single k, then you find the electric potential associated with the ch uh, with charge rotating disk with radius a. So, and, uh, but of course we can say that, okay, this may be just something funny that only appears in, the, in this particular coordinate patch in the Kirchhoff form of, the, of your metric. But here we're saying that it's actually there already kinematically on the shell. And, you can, and that implies that these double copy has to be there for generic visible observable. So uh, furthermore, this also tells us the fact that the Kirsch black hole is given by minimal coupling is a reflection that the spin is completely intrinsic. So what do I mean? So what I mean is that the entire spin of this interaction here is carried only by the external wave functions or the external line factors, the twos. And just to see this, you can, you can see that two and two primes, so since these are associated with spinners of different momentum, of course, the different momentums are related by a Lorentz boost. You can work out with the Lorentz boost factor. So that once you put, out the, put in the Lorentz boost factor in here, then you, you find that this is just basically one plus this thing here, which you can identify with the Pauli Lebansky spin vector. Okay? And so therefore, this two prime two, this, this interaction here is just basic identity times the Pauli Lebansky spin vector down in the Q to some S power for the spin. Now, as I mentioned, for a curved black hole, what you want to do is take spin to infinity. So if you take s to the infinity, this is nothing but the exponentiation, uh, exponential. So you know that at s to infinity limit, uh, this coupling becomes a, gives you an exponentiation factor, where the a is the, the spin factor. So that tells you that this black hole is corresponds to, if I look at it on show, it corresponds to an exponential factor that is with the spin. So what does this tell me? Well, this tells me that a very interesting thing that was known uh, long ago, but then nobody know what the origin was. So as I mentioned, since black hole corresponds to an extra, extra uh, a black hole with spin corresponds to an extra, extra exponential factor on shell, where the spin here is multiplied by the transverse momentum. That means for any observable here where I'm doing a Fourier transform associated with the transverse momentum, I'm going to generate a shift because of this exponentiation factor. Okay, so for example, the impulse of a probe particle, so this is a probe particle going through the spinning object. You can compute the impulse by just considering this two to two scattering with this Q exchange, you just take Q squared to zero limit. You do the Fourier transform of this, and then you pick up what is called what is known as an impulse. Now since once I have spin, since my four point is a factor of three points which have this exponentiation factor, which is the spin times the Q. And you're doing a Fourier transform with respect to Q, so you can see that with spin or without spin just corresponds to shifting your impact parameter from B to B plus IA. So, and you can do this, and you can do finish the double copy, and then you can compute the gravitational impulse, and you'll find that the gravitational impulse for a curved black hole indeed just corresponds to the, the, the short shell black hole just plus an imaginary part, where the A is the spin piece. And this is precisely what is known long ago when Kerr first wrote down his metric. So when Kerr wrote down his solution, uh, Janus and Newman noticed that when you look at the solution in the Kirchhoff form, this is the Schwarzschild solution. This is the Kerr solution. You notice how similar they look like. They look like each other. And more importantly, you can see 
that you can get the rotating black hole solution just from the curse of, uh, from the short shot solution just by performing the shift. You just you, you just first you write the short shot solution, you write it in this complexified form, and then you just shift r to r plus i cosine theta, and then you get precisely the curse shell so uh, the, the rotating black hole solution. They found this interesting uh, shift relation. But they, but they didn't know why this worked. Of course, it worked in the sense that you generate another solution. But in general, shifting a solution of a differential equation doesn't give you another solution. So this was mysterious at the time. Now we know exactly why this happened. When you look at it on shell, when you turn on the spin, basically you generate an exponentiation. And this exponential boosts your, uh, uh, shifts your parameter, uh, shifts your impact curve. Good. So let me try to generalize this thing. So I have minimal coupling, and previously we've seen that you take minimal coupling and then you do this this rotate this exponentiation factor, you generate curved black hole. So what are the other things you can do? So let's consider general a uh, general x, and let me shift this x by some function here. This function can only de depend on the kinematics of my three points. So I only have q, the the, the, the massless momentum, p, the massive momentum, and s, the spin. Now, unfortunately, p dot q and p dot s is already kinematically set to zero. So that means you have nothing you can do except q dot s. But you already know that q dot s generates spin. So naively, you say that, OK, then there's nothing that you can do. Well, of course, you can do the trivial thing, which is just shift it by a constant. You can do a complex phase shift. So what would this correspond to? If I just take the minimal coupling and do a complex phase shift, what would this correspond to? Well, in the electric coupling, uh, uh, the, the complex phase shift just corresponds to taking your charge and to make it complex. What does it mean when you have a complex charge? That means that you have a dion. Instead of just an original electric object, now you have an electric and a magnetic charge. That's what complex shift means. So that means that there must be some gravitational uh, object here through double copy, which also is related to the original short shell uh, solution by just a complex shift. It turns out that this complex shift, what this corresponds to, is actually the top knot, the top knot gravitational solution. And but this is actually telling you, this is telling you immediately two things. First, that the top knot must be related to short shot by some uh, by a shift. But furthermore, since the shift in the electric version was an electromagnetic duality, that means that there exists a gravitational image of this uh, electromagnetic duality that must exist and to be found. And so, the, and so the well, the, the, the punchline is that it's been found. So, uh, just to just to uh, if you want to, if you don't believe me, and, and since I say that you do this rotation on your charge, you get a dial. You can actually just do this simple computation. So, since I have this chart, this this rotation of my phase, I can again just compute my impulse. This is my impulse, and then I can compute the same impulse. This is a graduate or or even undergraduate uh, exercise. You can compute your impulse just using the Lorentz force formula. You plug in that the electric field is given by an electric, uh, an electric charge, but there's also a magnetic field. And then you just plug this into F. You, you write it in a, non -relative, in a relativistic form. And then you immediately compute your impulse of the dial, of something that a, a pro particle going through a dial. And you see that indeed this exactly matches precisely with the minimal coupling with the phase rotation. Now, you, now we can do the phase rotation, but do the gravitational version, and this will be what the gravitational version of the impulse look like. And then now you can compare with the spot of null space time. Or talk, if you want to compute the impulse in gravity, what do you do? Instead of Lorentz force in gravity, you do the geodesic equation, right? So you take your 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 uh, top knot space time, you write the metric down, you get the Christoffel symbol. These are all GR 101, and then you just write down the, the geodesic equation, then you solve, you, you, then you write it, it, the geodesic equation. Uh, of course, here, the, the top knot, you, you use explicit form with a top knot matrix, and of course, since we already know what the answer is, we can, there's a simpler way to do this. You first, you, you rewrite the geodesic equation in terms of this form, which you can do for top knot solution. And in this form, it looks almost like the Lorentz force equation, except that you have extra uh, gamma factors here. Uh, that modifies things, but this gamma factor is actually exactly what uh, cancel what these uh, in the electric version of these the, these caution cinch is and reproduce the correct uh, uh, cos two two omega and cinch two omega. As you can see here, some factors are canceled here. 
Okay. But the important, so the, here the, these few slides just showing you that indeed this phase rotation generates exactly the same uh, uh, gravitational impulse as you would get if you do it by just the geodesic equation. Okay, so indeed, that phase rotation corresponds to top knot. Now, what is the electromagnetic duality? Um, well, the electromagnetic duality corresponds actually to electric and magnetic, magnetic BMS charges. So it's, it's been uh, back, so this has been long, long ago, but, uh, but recent years this has been back into uh, in discussion about BMS symmetry. And BMS symmetry is basically telling us, is basically talking about any solution of the metric around that is asymptotically flat, you can write it in this form. And so, so, so there's a two-sphere, so it's asymptotically flat, so there's a two-sphere and infinity, this is a two-sphere metric. The important thing is that this entire thing is controlled by the function C, Z, Z. For uh, flat space, C, Z, Z is zero. Uh, now, if you have something that looks like this, this form, then you can show that this is actually invariant under uh, what is called a BMS translation. So BMS translation is generated by this BMS charge with some arbitrary function F, Z, Z bar. So this will be your transformation parameter. And the action of this acting on your metric is this differential equation here. Now, the important thing is that whenever this is real, the BMS translation is a symmetry of the metric. It maintains this, the, this form of the metric. But if we consider the, 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 the F to be imaginary, if we consider this to be imaginary, then this, this is the, since this is imaginary, it's no longer a symmetry of your metric. Well, what does it do? What it, once you have the imaginary uh, the BMS translation, uh, this is how the differential operator looks like. And you, once you act, it, act on it, uh, you precisely generate, uh, the, the, right. So the, if you use this, uh, this uh, transformation parameter, this is a differential form. And this exactly generates the, the solution for the top knot in, the, in, this, in this BMS representation. But importantly, the, what, what you'll find is that the BMS in the new solution, the BMS charge is shifted by this amount. Now, what is this amount? If you work it, work, work it through, you'll find that this amount exactly is a tall nut charge for the dual BMS uh, super transition. So there's a dual magnetic charge. So in other words, this rotation, this phase rotation, generates an electromagnetic transformation associated with the super translation and the dual super translation charge. And you have to go to BMS uh, uh, symmetry to actually show this duality transformation. But as I mentioned, in on-shell fashion, we, are, we just directly see that this is just a phase rotation. So everything is very extremely simple in this on-shell notation. Of course, you can consider even more, uh, if you have the presence of other masses still, for example, you can now consider charged black hole. If you have charged black hole, then basically when you, when you talk about you have charged black hole, what you're really talking about is you're talking about classical solutions involving extra massless fields. If you have extra massless field, that means that you would want to talk about how these extra masses feel uh, coupled to your uh, object. How much time? Three minutes. Okay. So, uh, base, so basically, the punchline here is that w is, is that for once you have extra masses field, you can show that, uh, for example, here, I mean, the few the last few slides, I'm just showing that. Uh, that, uh, for example, Kerr-Newman black hole, the difference between Kerr-Newman and Kerr is just that you have an extra massive field A, and the coupling of A to the, to the world line is also given by the minimal coupling. So this was just showing you, we derived the, the, the current of the, associated with, with Kerr-Newman black hole, and at the end of the day, once you, you map it back onto the coupling between the, the, the spinning object and the massive photon, you'll find it again reduces to minimal coupling again. It's just a simple coupling. So if anything, if the, the, I think the, the, the summary of the talk is this, this picture here. So now we have basic understanding of all the, the four-dimensional uh, solutions, black hole light solution, just in, in terms of a few sets of minimal coupling three-point interaction. So short shout is just this minimal coupling x to the graviton. Rice to Nordstrom, which means that it's charged, just means that you have minimal coupling to the graviton as well as minimal coupling to the photon. Kerr means that you can do something to this minimal coupling with an exponential phase, so I'm writing this S, so this becomes spinning, and this reproduces all the Kerr uh, behavior. Tall knot corresponds to you, you shift this, uh, instead of uh, exponentiating in the spin, you're exponentiating pure phase, and then you get tall knot. 
Uh, finally, of course, you can have Kerr-Newman, which is both uh, exponentiating uh, coupled to graviton and then exponentiating coupled to photon. Of course, this is the final thing that you can do is to exponentiate in, in phase and then also exponentiation in spin and also let it couple to, to photon. And that you, for that, you will get Kerr-Newman top knot. Okay, but I haven't put it here because all of these things that I've, I've listed here is that we have explicitly confirmed that we, we use this and we compute the, the impulse, the scattering angle, and exactly matches with the GR computation. Uh, for the other extension of top knot, the GR computation is much more involved and it's still in the process. I haven't put it here. But we have a prediction from the on shelf point of view of what those things look like. Okay, so in summary, so we see that in terms of this on shelf basis, properties of black hole solutions are, cl are cleanly captured. Basically, what is black hole? It just corresponds to objects that are scattering that are minimally coupled, and this minimal is defined kinematically. And the simplicity of the on-shelf basis reflects hidden, hidden relations for these classical solutions. Uh, the, for example, the double copy, the complex shift, the audio transformations. What is important is that these, this on-shelf basis, when we, when we view these things, even though we're viewing it from the point of view as a perturbative expansion in G, the relations that we find are actually all non-perturbative relations. Uh, of course, then there's lots of things to, to, to be done. We want to understand this beyond the first order in G. And beyond the first order in G, then there's an interesting question of what is black hole like Compton amplitude? How is this associated with the fact that if you have infinite, if you have high spins, there's generically causality violations. And you can also, since so string amplitude naturally gives you a bunch of spinning, high spin objects, what is the, what, what does string amplitude look in this form, what is the difference between leading and subleading trajectory? And we would like to approach, uh, start to apply this to the quasi-normal modes, which are more related to the black hole microstates. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, have you thought about uh, microphone? You, have you thought about uh, try to get gravitation away from this approach? Well, well yeah, I mean, so much this is already, this is, and this is, I mean, uh, this is, I mean, what people are doing. So basically, uh, uh, here, uh, the important thing is that if we were, once you have these onshore objects, you can start to compute the, the, the potential uh, of the two gravitational objects. Once you get the potential, so now you get the potential at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., and onwards. Once you have these potential, you can write down the equation of motion and you get the waveform. And so this is basically what the post-Newtonian approach is in computing the, the waveform that is relevant for the in-spiral phase. And yes, and so these on shell methods are applied in that. And, and, and the state of the art right now is already pushing a 3 p.m. order uh, to get these gravitation. But also for non spinning. So eventually these spinning uh, effects can be also be considered as well. Uh, Kermetric has a remarkable property that geodesic equations are completely integrable. This is connected with the existence of the so-called Carter integral of motion. Basically, it reflects the existence of the Killing tensor for this metric. In fact, Killing tensor uh, is square of more fundamental object, Killing Kiano tensor. And it's possible to show that Killing Kiano tensor in high dimension as well uh, results in the complete integrability and, uh, uh, and separation of variables. So in some sense, you have a lot of nice relations, and my uh, suspicion is that they somehow relate existence of these hidden symmetries, so namely everything which has this uh, conformal, uh, conformal laws uh, here in Kiana tensor uh, it results in the set of the conserved quantities. So your scattering amplitude possesses property. So somewhere in your approach, maybe hidden symmetry becomes very, very important. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. but these will be present in higher dimensions, right? There's yeah, there's four dimensions as well. Yeah, so, so, but no, but actually that's, that's one of the things that were that, that this, that this, well, even just the definition of the minimal coupling, uh, all of this was kinematically defined in four dimension. So there's the obvious questions of what corresponds to these, uh, so how extendable are these to higher dimension? And indeed, that is, and the higher dimension story will, will be different. And, and, and so, yeah, so, this, so, so uh, well, for just example, in five dimension, you will have black ring solutions. And, and so, right, so, so, so uh, 
but we also see that the, the that this structure actually becomes more general, or there's more degrees of freedom when you go to higher dimensions. So it will be interesting to to see like there may be a particular choice of these degrees of freedom will correspond to these integral systems. The integral. This approach uh, is from the Blanco evaluation, or is yeah. So, so of course, this is in a, a post Minkowski. So, this is a Minkowski expansion. So, this is in uh, G expansion. So, we don't really, you can't really talk about the horizon because then you would really need a full non-perturbative uh, uh, structure. But there are some things that we can discuss. Uh, for example, extremal conditions, since this is really related to the balancing of force. The extremal condition is associated with when the electric and the magnetic, uh, the electric and the gravitational force balances, and therefore you can compute these exchange and ask what do they balance. And this will be relevant for, for example, we can ex consider the case where you have dilaton. You know, if you have dilaton, that then means these minimal coupling will have an extra massless field to be exchanged, uh, which is the dilaton field. And then we can talk about the some extremality in that case. But in generic issues with, with respect to the existence or non-existence of the horizon or what happens around the high horizon, yeah, we can't really touch uh, at this moment. You don't need the, the horizon, I think. I mean, for example, just discuss uh, the lifetime, half-life of the grapple. Maybe you can quantize this uh, well-line action, and then you find some eventually part, like a Horner Heisenberg uh, uh, formulas. And Maybe this can be captured by the spinner density formulas. Yeah. So right, right. Yeah, we haven't uh, really. I mean, so this will be. I mean, this. I think this is really related. I mean, which is why we, we, we want another reason why we want to go in that direction. Which is this is really related to how do you characterize the black hole microstates, mm -hmm. which is related to the quasi-normal modes. Mm -hmm. So we also want to discuss the quasi. So basically, the next stage for us is we want to put the quasi-normal modes in this context and, and this, this describe it. And I think that will start to touch these questions because that is really, the quasi-normal modes is really what the black holes are if you want to talk about the information loss model. Okay. So, so Thank you very much. Well, just uh, some announcement. Of course, uh, dinner, right? Uh, so dinner uh, is on the fourth floor in the NCTS. Uh, so if you don't know the portal, then just uh, follow the, uh, 